All right, welcome back to Misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. I'm so excited to have our next guest here, Jana Kramer. She's a country singer, actress, mom, entrepreneur, best-selling author, podcaster, and my good friend. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for having me on, friend. I'm so excited for you, and I'm uh, I'm honored to be on your show. Great. Um, so first, talk to me about how you got into everything, because I first... Uh, knew you from singing your song about tell what's that song about the boy and the man oh, I got the boy she got the man yes because yeah. first of all when I first listened to that song I was like in tears it was my favorite song ever and I I was like this is my girl she gets me I get her so I always knew you as a country artist mm -hmm. yeah it's a uh, it's it's interesting because there's so many people that I, I love when people just know me from the countryside because a lot of the country crossover people knew me from the show one tree hill that I was on. So it's, it's really awesome to meet people that like just kind of know my music. Um, but yeah, no, got the boy was, so I had this high school sweetheart, Matthew, and I had been writing songs to like for my first album and just every song was about him, right? Like he was my first love. He was my first heartbreak. And so but none of the songs were like making a cut. And so my producer is like, who are you writing about? And I'm like, my, I'm a high school sweetheart who broke my heart. And I'm like, I still like wonder about him and like, you know, what could have been? And uh, he's like, I have a song that you need to listen to. And he played it for me. And I was no joke, like a puddle of tears in his office. Cause I was like, this is exactly it. Like I got the boy, she got the man. And there's no, like, that's literally it. And it was, um, I, I begged to have the song and actually, Jamie Lynn Spears, Britney Spears' sister wrote the song. So I called her and was like, can I please have this? And she was, she graciously gave me the song. And so, yeah, it was awesome. That's amazing. So you're from Michigan, right? I am from Michigan. Yeah. I, um, I was born and raised there. And then I moved to Los, actually, I moved to New York when I was 18. And then I moved to LA when I was 19 and pretty much have been just fighting, <laughs> fighting the good fight since then. Um, I, I kind of, I didn't go to college. I didn't want a fallback plan. And I, I, I knew what I wanted to be an actress and I fell into the singing from my, the show that I was on. So, but I mean, I, I like to call myself a scrapper. Like, I'm just like, I'm very scrappy. I just, I want to like hustle. And now that I'm a mom, you know, to, to two babies, I'm like, all right, like I gotta, I gotta work my butt off. So, so were you more into acting or singing as a young girl? Uh, acting. I didn't start singing until, probably like my middle twenties. I mean, it was the first time my family ever really heard me sing minus when I was six years old at like at one of those pageants that I did, uh, they had no idea. So it was just something I always wanted to try. And with being on a very musical TV show, I was like, Hey, I've kind of been writing a little bit. What do you think of these songs? And that's when they turned my character into a singer. So, and it's so funny because I've been, now that Netflix after COVID has gotten so big, I've been getting into shows that I would have never watched before. So I, I recently got into Grey's Anatomy and I'm watching it with my daughter and I'm like, wait a minute, I know her. That's my girl. Yeah. Young Jana. <laughs> very, very yeah. young. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, I'm watching like, you know, the Hallmark channel and there you are. And I'm like, what the hell? You're like all over the place. Like what kind of stuff have you done? that I'm going to see you on from the past and then in the future. <laughs> like Entourage, Friday Night Lights, um, One Tree Hill, Grey's Anatomy, uh, Private Practice, um, 902 and 0. Uh, and then, yeah. All the good of, ones. A bunch of Lifetime stuff. Uh, any any Christmas movie in a year, you'll, you'll be bound to see something. So, but it's fun. Okay. I mean, I like, I, I do about a Christmas film a year now just because they're really fun. They're wholesome. And, and they're, I, I love working with personally lifetime just because they're very good with the fact that I'm a mom and I need to bring my kids to set and stuff. So. Right. And how often are you writing music now or doing music? So I'm actually working on, we're not sure if it's going to be a full album, but it's definitely going to be an EP. I'm releasing a few songs. Um, well, I've, I've, I have a song coming out very soon. And then um, we, yeah, we'll be releasing an EP later in the year. But for me, it's more like, I just, I, I love being able to kind of do it all. And just, I have fun with, with it. And it's just kind of um, like, I don't tour as much as I used to just with, again, being a mom, it's tough, but I still love, I love writing. I love creating. I was just uh, with Lee Bryce, who's an amazing country artist. We just wrote a song together the other night. And so it's just, you know, I just, I love to create. And I think 
you know, girl, we've, we've lived some stuff. And so it's fun to get it out there on the page. Right. And so are you able to take your personal experience and use that to write music? Yeah. I feel like when it comes to music, I, I have a really hard time singing something that I can't connect to or that I haven't been through. So that's why, I mean, music has helped me in so many of my relationships and life and healing and growth and sadness. And so, you know, whenever I'm like sad, I go to music to either, you know, to listen to, to help. So that's kind of, for me, I'm like, I want to be able to sing something that I've gone through that hopefully can like help somebody else too down the road with whatever they're going through. So, you know, the, the, one of the songs that has been my most successful song was actually the song that I wrote for my kids after my divorce. It was about being a single mom and separating and, you know, basically facing the reality that, you know, we're not this perfect family that I, that, that you guys deserve, like in the fairy tales. And so I think when you write honest stuff, I mean, that's what people connect to. And and for me, that's like very important to, to continue to just be honest through music too. Right. So you've been married and divorced a couple of times now, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so was this last divorce the hardest? Talk to me about marriage was, and divorce. Yeah, it was the hardest because it was for me, when I look at my Wikipedia page, I say I've been married one time. Now on paper, that's not how it looks. But if you were to go back through the weeds of it, I was 19 years old. I knew a guy for two weeks. We went to Vegas and got married. That to me is not a marriage. That mm -hmm. was a whoopsie Britney Spears. I'm 19. I'm being stupid. I'm wearing Von Dutch, a t-shirt and, you know, Abercrombie pants. And I'm drinking a Shirley Temple, you know, and Elvis is saying like, you guys are married. Like that to me is not, you know, that was not a wedding or a marriage and time out, time out. Did you get married at the little white chapel? No, it was a drive through girl. Oh <laughs> my God. Wait, I no. got married there too, to <laughs> the, the father of my child, to, to Matt, to Wyatt's dad. And it wasn't the drive through but it was, I think there was a drive through section at that same chapel. So yeah, I, I kind of like waved to each other, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so embarrassing, but you know, it's like, you know, we were obviously that, that relationship ended uh, awful, but we, no one knew we were married. Like that didn't even, that didn't even come out until I was on dancing with the stars that I married this man. Um, or that I publicly like even admitted to it. Um, cause it was on the Wikipedia page. And then the second one, wait, we how long were you married? Well, again, like technically on paper one year, but again, nobody, nobody knew we, you know, it was, it, that, that one's a, he ended up going to jail for attempted murder. It's a whole, like that one was like a, a oh. thing. Yeah. <laughs> light, very light, like the light days with Jana. <laughs> um, and then the second one, we were married for a week. Like I literally walked down the aisle and go, oh my God, I'm making the biggest mistake in my life. And I cried yeah. to my best friend in the bathroom and, you know, he was, he was older than me, like 14 years older than me. And I think with that relationship, I was 26 years old, I think when we got married and we had the wedding and it was one of those things where for, for three years, I wanted his love and to be chosen. Cause he like, didn't want me to be his girlfriend. And so I just was like, like anxiously, like begging to be loved by this man. And I think once I got it, I was like, wait a minute, I don't even want to be with this person. Right. And so when I was walking down the aisle, I was like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta end this. Like, this is not what I want. And, and but I know me and I'm going to go have babies. And then I'm going to like have a, a, a divorced family. And for me, I grew up in a divorced family. And that was my nightmare was to have a divorced family of kids. Right. Cause I hated how I felt being pulled from like house to house and like, you know, separating Christmases. And I did, I didn't like any of it. So I'm like, I didn't want that anxiety. And so I, I immediately called that off. So to me, those two were not like, that wasn't a wedding or a marriage. Right. So sure. Mike, you know, who I was with for seven years. I mean, that was like, that was a, that was a marriage. We grueled, we fought, we loved, we struggled. I mean, that is something where I look back on and go, you know, yes, on paper, it's hard because people are like, oh, she's been married these many times. I'm like, well, if you really break it down, like that's, that's not what I would call a marriage and a wedding, but right. Yeah. Exactly. And you share uh, two children. We do. Yeah. We have two kids together. We have a seven-year-old daughter and then a four-year-old son. And, um, 
you know, we're like, we're co-parenting the best we can right now. It's, 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 um, I think it goes in waves, but I think after a season or the seasons of just like hurt and, um, now we're kind of, you know, he came and met us for dinner yesterday. So amazing. And how is dating going after you guys have now been separated and moved on kind of? So the first, well, at first it was fun. Cause a girl, like I, I didn't get, I mean, my ex was not, and you know, he was very public about this on our, on our podcast and we did it together, but like, he wasn't very affectionate. He wasn't very, um, loving. And so with me <laughs> at least, mm. and so <laughs> <laughs> with others, but not you, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so he, um, you know, when, when we got divorced, I had just gotten my boobs done too. So like I had right. this like, new divorce body, like I was feeling good. And so I think in the beginning, I, I'm not going to lie. Like the attention was kind of nice. Like, mm -hmm. well, at first, the first few months I was like, I'm never going to, no one's ever going to love me. I'm going to be alone forever. And like, you know, like, I'm just like, who's, who would want to be with me. And then it became, okay, you know what? Like, I, you know, I got a little attention and I think I liked it. And so that was a fun season. And then dating wise, I mean, I've only really had one boyfriend. Well, now minus my boyfriend now, but I think with that one, I just kind of picked the same person, just different face, but it was a lot, honestly, due to me because I was still, I didn't realize how much work I still had to do personally on myself because I was so anxiously wanting a relationship and mm -hmm. to be chosen and to be loved and to be validated through my relationship. Cause I always put my worth on whether or not I'm in a relationship and I'm loved. Sure. Yeah. So, so I mean, you know. Yeah. So, so was, I, think, I think something you and I share in common, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we both fall into this sort of love addict category. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I've struggled with where I sort of base my credibility or I've struggled with basing my credibility on the person that I'm with. And I, I struggle with, um, you know, being okay alone sometimes. And in the past, especially I've, I've, found my worth based on who loves me or who I'm standing with. And, um, you know, I really struggled with that in the past. And I, I felt that, you know, if I was with somebody either famous or important, or if everybody else wanted to be with that person and that person loved me, I was like, well, then I must be lovable. Yeah. Right. And, um, that, you know, it, that was the only way I could equate whether or not I, I, was worthy and it had nothing to do with me, you know, it just, it was really insane. And, um, that was really hard for me to learn that it was okay for me to like take a breath, not date somebody for a while and work on myself. And I kept what you're talking about. I kept picking kind of the same pattern of men. Um, and you know, some people are like, Oh, I always pick a narcissist or I always pick whatever, but it was kind of just the same person that made me feel worthy. And I found that it was always people that everybody else wanted to know or always wanted to be with because the bigger the person, the more important the person and that person wanted me. Sure. That is what gave me credibility because it was like the bigger the deal, the guy made me feel like I was the bigger deal because they gave me the power, you know? Yeah. So. No, I um, mean, I, I definitely, you know, there's a hundred percent or there's, there's definitely pieces in there that, you know, I can, I can relate to and yeah, I, I always equated, you know, if I was with someone, okay, then, then I'm, then I'm loved worthy and enough because they love me and they're powerful and they're, you know, they're successful and yeah. Yeah. And you guys struggled a lot though with the cheating mm -hmm. and he continually would do that. And then you would trust him again and then you would fall back on that again. Right. Yeah. I, you know, what's interesting is when you say like, I trust him again, I, I think back now and I'm like, I don't think I ever regained trust. And I think that was, um, you know, partially due because due to the fact that anytime we'd ever get some steady ground, it'd be knocked down again by another round of something or a text or a this or an affair. And so I don't think I really ever got steady ground with that relationship. And so, you know, there were times where I'd be like, I trust you. There was no chance in hell I could have ever trusted him. And looking back, I'm like, my body did not trust him. So like just how I was like very anxiously attached post-divorce to that first person I dated was because I just was like the control of like not 
of, of, of losing something or like not being in control of, um, you know, what's going to happen. Cause I didn't have any control. I'm like, my family could fall apart tomorrow. It's like, oh my God, I gotta like, I have to manage this and like, and, and, you know, make sure he doesn't do this or go there. And it's like, at the end of the day, like that just caused like such wreckage. But I, I don't think looking back, I could, even when I said, I trust you, like, I don't, I didn't trust him. There was no way. And now I know like how, what my body does and who I become when I don't trust someone. And that's what I told my boyfriend and like just people, I'm like, I know myself now. I cannot be with someone that I can't trust because I do not like the version I turn into. I don't like how it makes me feel. I don't like the anxiety. And it's like, and why? Like, I want to be with someone that I can trust. Right. And I, I, I remember worrying for you that it was going to affect your self-esteem. Like, have you gotten to the place where you realized that was not about you? That was about him and his self-control? Like, because it's so, I mean, from an outsider looking in, it so wasn't about you and you not being worthy. Like you, you do know that, right? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting when you say it because yes, I, I know, but there's always that little piece of me that goes, well, why wasn't I enough for him to change for me? So like if, when he dates the next person or is, I'm like, what was it? Why wasn't maybe I enough that he couldn't be that man for me? Or, and so mm -hmm. I don't know, like, as, yes, I could sit here and say like, yeah, like I know, and I do know I'm worthy and it wasn't me. And there was, you know, but I also think there's a piece of, because of just the damage and the, the belief that like I felt for so long that it still stays. There's a little piece that's kind of like, well, why, like, why wasn't, why couldn't he change for me? You know? Right. right. But it also could be the time in his life. It could be, you know, he eventually yeah. he may meet somebody and it has nothing to do with her per se. It has to do with him and the sure. time in his life, the work that he's done, whatever yeah. the circumstances are, you know, the lessons he's learned and it's just totally different. So I hope as your friend that you realize that yeah. it's and not I, about and, you. And I genuinely like, I, I do. And like, I can, you know, and I, just like, I know that if, someone were to cheat on me now, I'd be like, like, I'm not going to take that on as I I'm bad. Cause I would take that on as I'm bad. I'm not enough. And so it, that's, it really is. It truly, it has nothing to do with me. I think just like where, how deep that wound goes from like childhood of not feeling enough that like, it'll like creep up. And then I have to like, then I have to go, okay, what's the truth? No, the truth is that it has nothing to do with me you know, I did everything that I could and, you know, um, and I remember someone said too, like, and I hope he changes from that situation. I hope, you know, that because I was a strong woman and like that he changed, he is a better person because he was with me. Right. A hundred percent. So speaking of cheating, I mean, it's so interesting that like the, the news that's top stories these days in the news is cheating scandals, like this Vanderpump rule stuff. Do you follow that show? So, okay, I do not watch the show, but we broke it down on the podcast of like, okay, Tom is this and Tom did blah, blah, blah. And Raquel was, so like, I, I've, I've been, um, I've been told and now I understand about it. Yes. Okay. okay. So, so it's, it's funny, funny because I don't really watch the show either, but of course I've watched all the news that goes around it. And what I find interesting about it, number one, is that everybody is talking about it right? I mean, it's crazy. It's dominating the news cycle. And the fact that everybody from entertainment news to now, you know, the New York Times is covering the scandal, like it's, you know, the president having an affair. I mean, it's right. crazy. And like, uh, in... <laughs> Clinton. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or, or me and Tiger so to speak, you know, I mean, it's like, a really... I, didn't want to, I didn't want to say it. You did, but <laughs> it's okay. It's been a while. So it's fine. Um, How many years has it been now? Um, about 14. Um, yeah. So, but it's that level of like what people are talking about, but our story were not reality TV stories, right? They were real life. I mean, not that this isn't real life, but sure. you know, they're on reality TV. So they're, you know, fair game kind of, and they work in a bar. And yeah. so to me, it seems like a little nuts. And also these people weren't married. Right. Sure. So I also thought this was a little bit nuts. And to me, I think it's nuts because you know, Tom and this girl, it, oh. um, no, the other girl, um, Alana? no, Adriana area. We're so oh, bad. I think it's, 
Okay, yeah. Ari, is it Ariana or Alana or Ari? Okay, yeah. whatever. The yeah. other girl. We're dating yeah. for nine years. I mean, if he was going to marry her, don't you think he would have married her by now? So, I mean, I don't know. So, anyways, but they might have been having some issues there. And then this other girl, Raquel, is using love addiction as her excuse for cheating, which I found to be an interesting either PR move or maybe she's really using that as her excuse. What do you think about that? Well, it's interesting because we talked about it and in her, her apology is the definition of love addiction, but she doesn't admit to being a love addict. So when I'm Mm. reading it, I'm like, that is the definite definition of love addict. So if I was to go sit down with my therapist and say, okay, I think I have a problem. I've cheated, you know, with X, Y, and Z. And they're going to say this, that, you know, that is the definition, but she won't, but to my knowledge, I haven't heard her say like, I'm a love addict. Right. But she just definition. So it's kind of like, you know, listen, like, I know we both can, we've, we've both been there in these situations where we want to feel loved and chosen. Sometimes it takes us to places where, you know, we are, are not our best version and we would like, you know, or the timing of maybe if they're with someone like that's, you know, love addiction can really cause havoc and uh, it's a mess. Mm-hmm. I would have just, I mean, but I think at the core of it is we all want to be loved and wanted and valued. And I think that was just taken and love addiction takes it to the next level. And so I think that's basically what she's saying without calling herself a love addict, even though she literally uh, <laughs> quoted what it is. Right, right. So, I mean, I found it very interesting that that was what her PR team or her came up with and they kind of got it out of the dictionary, like you said. I mean, listen, being somebody who has been in the circumstance where I admittedly have been the other woman and do feel bad about it, I don't know that I would um, use love addiction as my excuse, sort of, so to speak, right? I mean, I made decisions and I feel bad about them. And, um, but I, I know why I did them and there were circumstances around it of why I did it. Do you know what I mean? So So, I found that hard to swallow. Yeah. So yes, but so I totally, so you're basically saying like, she's using love addiction as an excuse, kind of like a sex addict would use sex addiction as an excuse. Yeah. I I find find it hard hard when people people have behaviors, do things. And then after the fact are like, well, I did it because I was sick or whatever. You know what I mean? I, 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 I think that that's a a cop out in my opinion. What I also think on a separate note, which I think is nuts, is the public's reaction towards the whole thing and the level of anger that people are having for a lot of these people. Like I get, um, I think that the three of them have a lot of issues to deal with between the three of them. Mm-hmm. But the level of anger that I've heard from a lot of these people talking about the scenario seems on a different level that's crazy. Like um, when I read articles about people chiming in saying that Tom should be losing people at his um, bar, that people should walk out and not work for him. I think that's nuts. I think people saying, you know, hitting her in the face, if that's true or not. I think that's nuts. I think that's people being triggered by their own personal, um, you know, things going on in their lives that cheating is affecting them and their anger coming out on Raquel or Tom. Um, yeah. I think that is nuts how people are reacting to this story. And, you know, Lala Kent coming out and spewing all this venom and saying all this crazy stuff, I think is actually really inappropriate um, because I think it's actually a story between them. And that kind of thing can really affect people's lives. I mean, the way that people treated me for, you know, actually even up until now has been really difficult. And remember our interaction on your show, even you really didn't like me when I came on your show and we had to kind of talk it out, but like you had some anger towards me because I was the definition of a mistress and you had been cheated on and you had to realize I didn't actually hurt you personally. You know what I mean? So I think a lot of people have some major feelings towards her and she didn't cheat on them. You know what I mean? So I think it's, I think it's a little weird. And one, I also think too, when they're on the shows, like they, they, people think they're entitled to, um, to it all too. Right. So I, I don't, I don't like cancel culture. I think we're all extremely flawed and I think, you know, we all make mistakes. And I think if we were all to put our stuff out there, you know, on the table, like it, we would probably take our own stuff back. 
Um, and I just, yeah, I mean, what, what's hurtful is like, I don't like it when someone does something wrong and then someone else feels like they can then be an a-hole back because I'm like, you're just bullying a bully. Like, it's just like the, the, the whole thing is just like, it's, it's all just very mean. And I understand people are hurt and things were done, you know, things, you know, are, you know, weren't probably handled the right way. But again, like we're all flawed. We all have things. And I think at the end of the day too, it's, you know, these are people's lives. These are people that need like with the works telling them to walk out. Like that's, that's not okay. Like these people need jobs, money and supporting family. So it's a trickle effect. And I just, I just wish people would operate from love instead of just like, yeah, like looking, you know, how I was with you in the beginning, I operated with hate instead of love. Right. So I looked at you and was like, ah, like it's a vendetta against you. You didn't do anything to me. You know, I just put you in a category of the other, you know, so and that's what I think they're doing. They're just putting her in a category that's like, oh, we hate this category. Well, it's like, well, you don't know. And like, we all have, like, we all, she coped in a really bad way of wanting this, you know, and we've all, again, I said, we're all flawed. We all make mistakes. Right, right, right. Um, so you've kind of done a lot of work and you know a lot of stuff about love addiction. Do you want to talk about the difference between love and sex addiction? So from, from my knowledge, and again, I'm not like, you know, I've, only from just sitting in on certain things, the sex addiction piece is taking it to, um, you know, maybe an excessive amount of porn or, okay, uh, escorts, prostitutes. I mean, they, they take it to a whole other, like with using sex, um, yeah. love addiction, is, you know, obviously just, um, that other form is, yeah. Like getting into situations like Raquel did and, uh, to feel validated, chosen and loved. And, you know, I, I think at the core, nine out of 10 people are love addicts. If you really like, there's a quiz out there and I've, I've had people take it and more people checked the boxes because we all want to be loved. Some yeah. people take it to an extreme place to get that love and attention. Yeah. And I think so many people don't really know what love addiction is, but they have heard more about sex addiction. And so yeah. they assume their, you know, their partners are sex addicts or. Well, and people say like, you know, people, I would always say to my ex too, like, oh, that's just an excuse. And I'm like, well, I mean, like, listen, people grab the bottle, like, and they act like a holes when they're drunk and oh, it's just alcohol. No, but that's a problem. They have a problem. Okay. Just like sex addiction. He had a problem just like love addiction. Okay. You're, you know, you're, you're cheating on a, let's just say married man, whatever. Like that's, that's a problem. Like to fill whatever that is inside that's yeah. a problem, which is why it's a disease and it's an addiction because yeah. you and it's like, I know in my twenties, like love addict to my core, I was just like needing that hole inside that no man could ever fill. Didn't realize that it had to be me Learned that one the hard way. So, right. you know, so now you're in a, what looks like a much healthier relationship. How have you gotten to that point? Cause that gives me hope. Tell me everything. It was truly just sitting with myself and just being absolutely okay being alone because I could say, oh yeah, I'm fine being alone. Like after my divorce, I was not fine being alone. I was constantly scrolling or looking or, you know, trying to find, you know, someone. And I just got to a place where I'm like, it was, it, it was acceptance to be honest. And I was like, I'm not going to be alone forever because the story in my head was I'm not good enough. I'm going to be alone forever. So I got to find someone that really like loves me and wants me. And that's just not the truth. Like the accepting the fact that you are not going to be alone forever. There will be someone that is going to love you that wants to be with you. And it's, it's, you know, I had to break down my walls of, of having, cause I would push guys away, good guys away because I'm, I would call, I would say, I'm not lovable. I'm not enough. They they're not, there's no way they're going to love me. And finally I had to learn how to freaking love myself. I did. I went to this retreat center that just changed my complete outlook on just, I had so much shame that I was carrying that I had no idea that I was carrying and just did all this work on myself to just get, you know, rid myself of that. Now I still have moments of it, right. That kind of like pop up, but like, again, I go to the truth and so I think just acceptance, getting, you know, healing from the inside and just really just being okay with myself and going, you know, yes, right now I, I love the relationship in my, I'm in, I think he's wonderful and I hope he's my person. 
And I've also gotten to a place that I will be totally okay if not. Now I could never say like usually I would I would hold on because then like I wouldn't want him to leave like I'm I I guess I would be sad but like I would I will be okay, right right. So um, and how okay. how did you guys meet? He DM'd me. <laughs> oh my god, I love that. He did, and I I kind of just was like eh, like at that place I was just I I didn't really want to be in a relationship and he lived in England and I was like oh, I don't. So I, I kind of let the DM go, but something just kind of kept drawing me back to, to his DM. And it was just very sweet and kind. And, uh, and then we just, yeah, we started DMing back. And then, you know, after like a month or so of talking, we got together and it was just with him, it just feels, um, I feel very safe with him. And I feel, and I think it's because I've broken down the, the anxious attachment inside because I was so massively anxiously attached anxiously attached and a love addict together were like the, the t- a terrible combination. Mm-hmm. So it just kind of flows and it's just, it feels really nice. Right. Yeah. I remember once being with someone who gave me very good advice once and they told me that you have to, you know, they reminded me that I, you shouldn't have to cling to somebody to know that they're with you. That yeah. like, if you know that you can let go of them and they are still with you and you feel a tight bond, that that is really when you have the best, closest bond with them. Do you know what I mean? For sure. So, yeah. So you have a long distance relationship with them? Yeah, he lives in England. Um, but, you know, again, it's the, I'm just such in a mind space now where I'm like, whatever is meant to be will be whatever's meant to, it's, it's almost like I've taken some, like, I don't know, like office space pill where I'm just like, I'm just, everything is like, I just, I want everyone to be happy. I want my ex to be happy. I want to be happy. I want you to, it's like, I just, I'm like, whatever is meant to be is going to be like, just, I, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to just be grateful. And, um, you know, I, again, I, I really would love to continue what we have going on and I have got, you know, I've got good feelings and I've, I have, you know, I'm in my brain, I, in my heart, it's like, you know, there's things that I would love to see, but also I know that I'll be okay either way. Right. Well, I love that you have faith and belief in love time and time again, even though sometimes you keep getting, no, but you keep getting kind of shot Shot in the heart heart and then you keep coming back. I love that. It just gives me such faith. I love that. Well, cause I just, I'm like, you know what? Like I, I know I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker for love. I love, I love to love. I really do. But it's just, I, I would rather that than, than not try. Cause here's the deal. It's like, I feel like every time it, the, I've, the picker's getting better, right? Like you learn and you grow and it's like, you know, you see what you want and you don't want. And so you, the only way you can do that is to put yourself out there and love and learn. And, you know, with this relationship, if it doesn't work out, well, I'm going to learn a lot of lessons for the next one. Right. So that's something too, to, to, you know, to think about as well. It's like, there, there are so many lessons in everything you do. And I don't want to, I don't want to be the jaded girl that's like gotten her heart broken or beat up and, you know, verbally, you know, physically abused. It's like, yeah, I have. And also like, I still believe in love and I still believe that like, it doesn't have to be that hard too. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I've always just like, Oh, I'm like exhausting options and everything's just so hard. And it's like, it doesn't have to be like, and now I'm in something that shows me that it's like, when there's just honest, true love, it doesn't have to be that fight all the time. And also it's such a good lesson for your children to see you in a happy relationship. So many people stay in a bad marriage just for their children. I'm not somebody who believes in that. I'm a child of divorce. And I know that I've met a lot of people that are in bad marriages because they think they should stay in a marriage for their children. I, I don't believe in that. I think it's totally okay for people to get married at uh, divorce so that they can provide a better life for themselves and for their children. Um, talk to me about motherhood right now for you and how that is being a single mother. Yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, you know, same, I grew up, you know, divorced parents and in my mind, they divorced way too late. Like there are things that I saw at 13 that I wish I never saw. Right. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, I, I don't want that. Did I want to have separate holidays and have them go to their mom and, you know, mommy and daddy's house? No, not at all. Having said that, I can sure as hell guarantee you that my ex is a lot happier. We're happier together. I mean, like, we're actually like very friendly, you know? So it's like, we're, 
we laugh together probably more now than we laughed together when we were married. So it's like, you know, it's, it's great for them to see this version of us that I wish they could have seen when we were married. But again, like that's, that's done, like have to move on. And and now in this space, it's, you know, I think in the beginning it was really challenging. It was really hard, but now that we've gotten into the groove, you know, I've, I've got them 70% and, um, which is amazing. And, um, again, he's very helpful if, if a movie comes up or, or travel. So, I mean, we're, um, co-parenting's good. And for me, I just, yeah, I want my kids to have fun. I want them to be happy kids. And, and, um, you know, and I also love the fact that they see me work too. Cause it's like, I have to provide for them. I pay child support. Right. So I'm like, I gotta, like, I gotta put my head down and, and grind for them. Right. So what's up next for you? What are, what are the big things in your life coming up? So podcasts, I have my wind down podcast. We tour that, which is a lot of fun. I love meeting people and, and going out there and, um, you know, just saying hi. Cause you know, we talk about all this stuff on there too. And it's just, it's, it's nice to just like be open and hopefully, you know, help people around, you know, along the road. And then, um, I got music coming out later this year. I'll be filming some Christmas lifetime movie at the end of the year. Good. And then I've been working on something that has, is very personal to me that'll come out later this year. Um, in a, I can't ex- really announce it yet, but they'll be able to get their hands on it at the end of the year. So I'm very excited. Um, I've put a lot of work into that. And so my mission is just to help, you know, people not give up because it's, uh, I've, I've wanted to a bunch and I just, I think we're all, we're all very deserving of love. And I just hope people like, you know, to circle back to like the Raquel's of the world, like, and just do the work. Cause once you do it, like, and I still have therapy in one hour. So it's like, I'm going to just continue to learn. And, and, um, we all are deserving of healthy love. Right. Well, thank you so much. I'm always on your side. I'm always rooting for you. You always give me hope. So I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. I love you, friend. Thank you. Thank you.